Right now, we've got not enough houses, too many buyers. And that's changing rapidly here, especially by next month. In my opinion, if your business model involves buy, fix up and sell, turn that off now. You're listening to 5-Hour Real Estate Week, where you'll learn to consistently buy real estate in only five hours a week. So if you're ready to invest in real estate, achieve financial freedom, and own the lifestyle you deserve, even with your job, this is the show for you. Now, here's your host, Mike Butler. Mike Butler here, and welcome to the 5-Hour Real Estate Week podcast. And today's episode is part two of a nine-part series on updates for today's rapidly changing market. And my goal is to help you two steps ahead of the curve and not get bogged down into the messes that are going to be happening for a ton of other investors who are not on the 5-Hour Real Estate Week podcast. Let's dig into it right now. I can recall when I got started years and years ago, I used to look at a property and I bought many, many houses because they were a deal. Okay, just a D-E-A-L. What was I going to do with it? I had no idea. And within a short period of time, within the first few years, I attended some seminar or boot camp somewhere, and I discovered, I was learned, I was taught about exit strategies. Now, what is an exit strategy? Exit strategy is basically foolproof formula to give you confidence that you're purchasing a deal, and not only is it a deal, but you get to analyze with confidence what's the best strategy to do with this property. You might have heard highest and best use, things like that. So when I got started, we had three basic exit strategies. One was wholesale. Number two was buy and hold, make it a rental. And number three was retail. And so retail would be like buy, fix up and sell with all the flippers and the dolphins and all that's what they're doing today. And unfortunately, that is not investing, okay? Okay. We'll get into that in the next part of this nine-part series when it comes to taxes. But let's expand on each of these exit strategies. And after getting these three basic ones to start with, I've added a few more because you can really do a lot of good things if you understand your exit strategies. And here's the most important part about exit strategies. This is something you must do before you make your offer. So let's start off with number one, wholesaling. We get bombarded with all kinds of folks, whether they're using telemarketers, postcards, letters in the mail, text messaging now, and they all come out and they say, we want to buy your house. We want to buy your house. Okay. If you just want to have a little reply, tell them to send you an offer and don't answer their questions. But wholesale is simply put, you go out there, you make an offer and your exit strategy is I can wholesale it. All right. So if you're going to wholesale it, You need to factor in when you run your numbers for wholesaling, how much do you want to put in your pocket? If you're dealing with low end properties, would that be three or four or 5,000? If you're dealing with middle of the road, would that be 20 or 30,000? If you're doing high end, perhaps it's well over a hundred thousand or more, but you factor that in before you make your offer. Now I will say this. If you follow the Mike Butler's investor pledge and you go out and you look at a property, guess what? You're going to make an offer. Mike Butler's investor pledge is, I promise to myself and my family from this moment forward to make an offer, even if ridiculous, on every property I take time out of my day to go view. Now, when I started doing that, holy cow, that's made me well over a million dollars. Because how many times have you gone and looked at a property and you say, money pet, no deal here, and you walk away? I did that. I couldn't tell you how many times I did that. But about my second or third year investing in real estate, I said, you know, my time's too precious just to walk away. I'm going to make a ridiculous offer. So now that is paramount. That is the golden rule. Etch that in stone. So wholesaling is to simply make an offer on a property and factor in how much you can sell that to another investor. That's the simple version. Then we have wholesaling. Let me expand on wholesaling just a minute. Okay, if you really want to almost double your profits or more, if you're a wholesaler and you're in a position where you can do this, when you wholesale the property to another investor, most of the time, these are fixer-uppers. Okay, imagine this, getting some money down now and then finance the balance with interest-only payments. That can really bump up your profit on your wholesale deals. Now, wholetailing, wholetailing is T-A-I-L at the end. This is not someone standing on a corner somewhere. 
like uh, <laughs> the people across the office when I was a detective used to work. But hoteling is simply this. You got a nice house in a decent neighborhood where it's, it looks like mostly owner-occupant properties. Well, here's what I'll do. If you can always wholesale a property, that's always going to be an exit strategy, okay? But what about hoteling? Here's how that works. Just go to Home Depot and get you a for sale by owner sign. And because that loudly announces what's going on. Okay. And this is in a subdivision where mostly owner occupants live there. So you put this for sale by owner sign up there. Maybe you put your cell phone number. Maybe you put your, your email. I don't know, but put it up there and you're going to do this for two weeks. And what's going to happen is all the nosy neighbors, they're going to call. They're going to find out how much it is and all this and that. And the magic to making it happen at hotel prices, you're going to be 85% of what everything else is selling for minus repairs. Because if it needs paint and carpet, that's a fixer upper for a homeowner. And you got people up and down that street, they've got access to money. They got HELOCs, you know, maybe Henry and Ethel's cousin or nephew or somebody needs help to get their first home and get them a fixer upper. So only give that two week time limit because then that expires. But wholetailing, you should make more wholetailing than you do wholesaling. And once again, you can really add to it if you can do wholetailing and offer some kind of seller carryback financing. Now, the next one is buy and hold. Now, buy and hold simply, that's it. You're going to make it a rental property. Run your numbers. I don't have time to get into all this right now, but you need to run your numbers for rentals. And remember, you're analyzing these exit strategies before you make your offer. Okay, so you're going to run your numbers to see how it works for wholesale. Run your numbers to see how it's going to work for wholesale. Okay, now run your numbers to see how it's going to work for buy and hold. And when you run your numbers for rentals, go back and check episode number four, episode number 86, and episode number 105. Those three there will give you a better understanding of how to run your numbers to see if it's going to be a good rental. Now, caution, add this into those three episodes. Factor in today's interest rates. If you're going to do something close to a Burr method, okay, factor in the interest rates. Homeowners getting five and a half percent now fixed for 30. Today's Wednesday when I'm doing this and the feds are supposed to raise prime another half point today and another half point next month. So that's a full one point. And as a rule of thumb, investors, you can get up to 10 loans with federally backed loans and let's say they're 30 year fixed. Once you cross that hurdle there, Nobody knows you. You can't get 30-year fixed anymore. It's very, very hard to find. So just call the local banks, credit unions, whoever does loans, and see what the going rate is for investors on rental property. And when you factor your numbers in there, remember to always put pay me first. Okay. And the Fed, if you've not been keeping up with this, they say they're going to raise the rate six times in 2022. So you got to factor that in there. Now, the next exit strategy is retail. Now, retail covers a lot of ground here, but this could be the buy, fix up and sell, which a lot of folks call that. I flip houses. Okay. I'm a flipper. I do luxury homes. I do this. I do that. And a lot of folks have made a ton of money over the last five years. Look at all the TV shows that promote flipping. Well, if you understand taxes a little bit, flipping is not investing. Flipping is sort of kind of like having a used car lot. So you go to the wholesale car auction, you buy a car, you bring it to your car lot, you put some lipstick on it and mark it up and sell it for a higher price than what you paid for it. That, my friends, is earned income. That's a job. You got to do something to make that money. Well, guess what happens? What if you're in a car wreck or somebody gets laid up or life happens and you can't physically do that anymore because you're laid up in a hospital or what have you? How much income are you going to get? It's all going to dry up because you don't have any deals pending, right? So that's not investing. Caution. Now, the flippers and the folks that are all fired up about doing this, they're going to get spanked. So if you take a look at history, let's go back to the last financial tsunami that we had. And I know a ton of investors who went belly up, filed bankruptcy. Banks, a lot of banks they hit the wall. They went belly up. They were dissolved and taken over by the feds. One in particular here locally was financing a ton of builders, a ton of land development where they were creating subdivisions and all this net. So builders might have 20 or 30 or 50 houses that they're building 
And guess what? The funds drop. Guess what happens when the interest rates go up? People slow down buying, don't they? Are you going to get the super aggressive appreciation like we've had over the last three to five years? I don't think so. Foreclosure moratorium's over. So you're going to have foreclosures coming back into the market. Right now, we've got not enough houses, too many buyers. And that's changing rapidly here, especially by next month. In my opinion, if your business model involves buy, fix up and sell, turn that off now. Imagine what your headache would be if all of a sudden, and we've got inflation, we've got utilities going up. There's nothing good in our economy right now. But if you've got interest rates going up, that means fewer people can buy because money's harder to get to. They can only buy less house than what they could this time last year. And you don't want to be stuck with three or four flippers that you got to take a huge discount to get it sold. And how do you factor that in when the market has changed? Here's what I used to do and teach. If you wanted to retail a house, well, then look at the neighborhood that it's in. And this is how bad it was back in the day, if you don't remember. Take that neighborhood or that subdivision, and let's say there's eight houses for sale. Only one's going to sell this month. Which one is it going to be? The highest price? The lowest price? No, none of that. If only one out of eight houses is going to sell this month in that subdivision, the one with the best value, what does that mean to me and you? How about this? 85% of what all the others are selling for. If we do the Fred Flintstone method, three-finger math, okay, I like that. It's simple. Let's say you got eight houses for sale in this neighborhood for 100000 bucks. Okay, just bear with me and pretend like it's Mayberry. We're here to learn. So if there's eight houses for sale at 100000 and you want yours to sell, and you're one of the eight, I would suggest knocking that price down to 85000 assuming that you've polished the inside of that. You put granite countertops in it. You reworked the shower, the bathroom, the kitchen, and this thing is pristine, all new light fixtures, and the outside is professionally landscaped. You see where I'm going with this? So you will have by far the best value in that neighborhood. And if your sale price is 85% of what the other ones are, if your sale price is 85000 guess what? They're going to pick yours over the other seven. So be careful in there. You're going to have to restructure your formula if you're going to still continue to do buy, fix up, and sell. You can do it, but your margins and your everything's got to be adjusted. So pay close attention to that. In fact, I would say as this market is changing, I wouldn't even pursue do buy, fix up, and retail and sell like the flippers do. Now, you can still make money wholesaling. You can always do that. But real true wealth Building, building your wealth happens with buy and hold properties. Now, another exit strategy that, and this has several in here, and I've learned this over the years because how many times, if you're a serious investor, you put a deal together, okay? You meet the motivated sellers and you work out and you do an agreement, got a price, and they, you ought, I mean, you make them an offer with your per, one simple one page purchase and sale agreement and they accept it and boom, you got a deal. Now you got to get it closed, right? Or assign it or wholesale it, what have you. Well, I've always done this. And remember, I'm a buy and hold guy. So I didn't aggressively pursue wholesaling. Okay. I said, why give that away? I want to keep it. Now your dogs, you can wholesale. But anyway, back to this last exit strategy. Think about your self-directed Roth IRA, the one for your spouse. Think about a health savings account where you get double tax benefits for that. How about education account, CISA account for your kids? And all of those I do with Cama Plan. Yeah, I've got some at Equity Trust, but their fees are a lot higher. It's just like having a bank. So I highly recommend Cama Plan. They have lowest fees, the best education, and just check it out, dot com, And tell them Mike Butler sent you. I don't get a nickel for promoting it. I just want them to know that I'm out there promoting it. And the owner of that is Carl Fisher and his sister Margie, and that's how they came up with Cama. Okay, so camaplan.com. He's a genius. So much for the commercial there. Just do it. So here's what I found. After I put a deal together, I would find myself at night laying in bed and, and sleeping. And I said, holy cow, that would be a great IRA deal. You're always tweaking. And how can I make this deal better? How can I tweak it just a little bit to make it more valuable, more profitable, reduce taxes, all that kind of stuff. And so bingo. So uh, self-directed Roth IRAs, you got to have them. So that's it in a nutshell for exit strategies. Remember, go back. If you want to run your numbers for your rentals, 
Check out episode four, number 86 and number 105. And we've got a sponsor for today. <laughs> okay. So imagine this interest rates going up. It's going to be harder to buy properties. We've been spoiled or you've been spoiled for the last 10 years with next to zero prime interest rate. And now they're creeping up at a very fast pace. And so you're going to be locked out of that. But today's sponsor is a jumping loan system. And what this is, it's America's only U.S. attorney approved takeover payment system. And this is what I use for majority of my Roth IRA deals. And it is awesome. What it allows you to do, imagine this. How would you like to step in and take over payments? My daughter refinanced her home. She got a 2.5% fixed rate. Randy Hammer down in Florida and up in Indiana, he just used the jumping loan system. And he stepped in and took over payments on a VA loan with 2.1% fixed. I don't care if the interest rates go to 7%, 8%, 9%, 10%. There are still plenty of people out there having a hard time that still are making payments on super low fixed rate loans. That's going to be your magic buying tool in this rapidly changing market. You don't want to sit on the sidelines and watch everybody else blow past you and you struggle. How about you being the one that leads the charge, takes advantage of all these new opportunities that are happening, and you won't have to worry about the challenges that are coming up because you've already got that solved. So here's what you do. Go to jumpinloans.com and you can save over 50% right now. Jumpinloans.com. And you got to use this coupon code. This is all small case letters. J-U-M-P-1-K. That's jump. One K is a coupon code. When you go to jumpinloans.com and enter that coupon code, and you'll save over 50% right away. So if you're getting started in real estate, go listen to episodes one through 10. It's a mini course on how to get started. And I need your help, please. If you like what you're learning here, please click the follow button or the subscribe button. I don't understand all this social media stuff. They show me how to do podcasts. So go ahead, buy my book. It's the number one bestseller. It's Landlording on Autopilot. You can get it on Amazon. If you want one personally autographed, go to my website at mikebutler.com and make sure that you sign up for the free Power Lunch Investor Training Webinars. They happen every Tuesday at noon at MikeButler.com. It's absolutely free. So this wraps up part two of this nine-part series on exit strategies. You need to know these before you make your offer. And there's been some adjustments made and understand those things with this rapidly changing real estate market today. Adios. See you on the next one. Bye. Glad you joined us for another episode of Five Hour Real Estate Week. The best thing you can do now is put this information to action. To help you get started, Mike created a free resource for you called How to Buy 50 Houses a Year, Even with Your Job. Download it now by going to mikebutler.com forward slash 50 houses. And we'll see you on the next episode.